welcome our our uh, our guest speaker today, Scott Howitt, who's going to be giving a presentation on balancing the tug of war: how CIO and CISOs can partner for better IT. Uh, quick bio on Scott: He's responsible for McAfee's corporate systems, leading the IS and IT organizations, and driving the company's cloud transformation. Scott and his teams focus on alignment of technology to company strategy partnerships with product and sales teams to ignite innovation and positive customer experiences. Scott joined McAfee from MGM Resorts International, where he served as CISO and CIO while leading the information security and privacy program for all 27 resorts worldwide. He was a commissioner on Nevada's DHS Cybersecurity Commission and was a founding member and served on the board of the retail and hospitality ISAC. Scott earned his BA in physics from the University of Texas and, it, and attained his CISSP in 2005. In his free time, Scott's a voracious reader, as we all should be, an avid hiker, and he enjoys spending time with his wife and three daughters. And I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you. I appreciate it and, and super excited to be here. So, you know, what I wanted to go over today is uh, I've, I've had the, the fortunate uh, happenstance of, of serving in a lot of different roles in technology. And so some in security, some as a, a thought leader, and some as a CIO. And, and so I wanted to go, one of the things that I've observed is there seems to be some tension uh, between the CIO and CISO relationship. And I wanted to explore that a little bit and then talk about how maybe it could work together better because in, in the age of COVID that we've seen is certainly innovation and speed is important in an organization and having a tense relationship between the CIO and CISO really will slow down that agility. So let's, let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started on uh, talking about it. So, you know, a little bit about my background is, um, hold on, sorry about that. You know, I, I started in IT and I was a, a programmer at the old uh, EDS, which was Ross Pro's old company. And then it evolved into me becoming uh, chief technology officer at a dot com. And, and really enjoyed that and, and, and did that for four or five years until we sold off. And then I became the CIO at Benefit Mall and, and probably a little bit too young. It was another um, dot com where we sold health insurance for small groups online. And, and so what I realized is if I wanted to become a CIO at a much larger organization, man, I didn't know anything about information security. So I, I took a role at Alliance Data where I became the director of information security, fell in love with being in security. And so I went on to be the CISO at JCPenney and then the CISO at MGM Resorts International. And then, um, you know, through all those years of being a CISO, had a, a very tight relationship with McAfee and I knew the CEO very well. And he said, hey, why don't you come over and, and be our CIO and I'll also give you the security organization. So have certainly seen it from, from both sides of the table. And so it's always been interesting. So if you, if you look at the history of the, the CIO role itself, so sometimes the best way to look at where the future is going is to look a little bit at the past. And so the very first time that the the to, you know, the term CIO was coined was is talking in a book by uh, Senate and Gruber called Information Resource Management. And, and so uh, when they described the CIO at the time, though, it was really a role that was typically in the application space. And if you look at the state of technology back then, uh, it was the same year that they used the term was the same year that the IBM 50, 5150 came out. Uh, my dad was an old long-term IBM where we had one of these. And I remember for 500 bucks, you could buy a, a two megabyte hard drive to stick in the expansion slot there. So that, that was a state of technology at the time. And so there wasn't a lot of huge budget responsibility. In fact, if you look at how technology worked in the time, usually it was buried within the business function itself. So this is the first time you're really seeing the, the role emerge from the business space and become its own role. And it did take quite a few years before it really elevated up to the level of other C-suite officers, right? But there's also always been a challenge of, are organizations really getting the value 
from the technology, right? And I think this is why you're seeing some of the new roles pop up in some organizations where you see like a chief digital officer or you see a chief innovation officer and integration officer is, you know, the role of the CIO for so long has maybe been about budget control instead of about innovation and things like that. And, and so the role is still evolving. And so if we, if we take a look at the next one where the history of the CISO, you know, the first CISO came into being in 1994, it was Steve Katz and, and it was after Citi had experienced a breach and he got hired into the CTO organization to kind of take the reins and look at how they were doing security in it. And again, that role in and of itself is usually the career path started is, you know, for those of you that have, that, you know, remember the mainframe times, it was, hey, uh, you know, I was doing ACF2 or top secret or rack F for the mainframe. And then it evolved into maybe a compliance function. And then it really evolved into a bigger function, especially the last few years. So in the first years, they, they were rarely appear to the CIO. In, in, in a lot of cases, were buried below even the CTO. And so maybe they were hanging out somewhere in the infrastructure organization, right? And, and now we've seen a lot of cases it's involved into a compliance function but, you know, what's the reason that we have security? And if you really think about it, the reason that you have a security officer in the organization is to enable the business. So if you use the analogy of like an automobile, right, we can move at faster speeds because we have airbags and we have anti-lock brakes and we have seat belts. And so, you know, automobiles can go faster and still keep their passengers safe than they could many years ago when we didn't have a lot of these safety features. And so this is really how, you know, the, the CISO should start to view themselves in an organization. So, you know, let's now let's fast forward to today, where's the CIO? Again, a lot of companies not only have a CIO, but they probably have some other digital officers or something like that. And you're seeing in some organizations, a role of the CIO eroding or going away. In a lot of cases, that's because the organization is viewing them as, hey, you're not nimble enough, or you want too much control and you can't let the business innovate, right? And there is an expectation now that the CIO is not just a technology guy. In fact, I would argue that you don't even have to be a technologist to be a CIO. You have to be somebody who really understands the business and can help them go out and enable that, right? In, in nowadays, if you, you know, it used to be that the IT function built a lot of things, but now with so much available in the cloud, it's almost like you have an erector set available, you know, at your disposal and you can just start tying APIs and things together to build your ecosystem as it suits you. Sure, there's always still some need for customization, but that's not as important anymore, right? So you really got to, it's really more of a, how do I more quickly bring capabilities to the organization in order to, for them to adapt, right? And so if you look at the state of the CISO today, in a lot of cases, they've elevated to the role of the CIO or maybe even beyond. So if you look at the, the you know, National Association of Corporate Directors and what the top risks are on a board, cybersecurity, where it used not to even be on the radar screen 10 years ago, is now usually number one or number two concern of all organizations. And so a lot of times the CIO will report directly to the general counsel or maybe even to the CEO. So when I was at MGM Resorts, you know, the CIO wasn't in front of the board, you know, very often. I was in front of the board with every board meeting. And, and so, and I reported directly to the CEO where the CIO typically was reporting to the COO and, or the CFO. And, and so, you know, it was really a situation of, you know, security was of paramount importance, right? But, 
I think I do see it in a lot of board presentations that I've seen other CISOs give or have been involved in is they're struggling to verbalize a business value to the organization is, yep, it's important that we have a security function, but how are you helping to enable revenue within the organization? And maybe it's just keeping it safe and making sure it's always available, but then sometimes maybe you're helping innovate in the organization and, and how do you verbalize that? And forever, you know, I've, I've always made the joke that, you know, hey, being a CISO is great because when I was a CIO, there was always budget constraints. You know, nobody wants to be the guy who kept the CISO short on the budget and then a security incident happens. But, you know, for far too long, uh, you know, the CISOs have been like sailors in port that just have a little too much money to spend. And now that we're in an, an era when budgets are tightening, the CISOs are finally starting to see their budget shrink, right? And two, CISOs are used to having this walled garden that they were able to protect where it was, hey, it was my, you know, my corporate network and, and maybe I'm also connected to the internet and, and maybe I also have some websites, but that's okay. And now what we're seeing is that's rapidly evaporated in, in the push to cloud, you know, where it used to be, yeah, I have some cloud agenda or transformation agenda on my radar screen. Hopefully it'll happen in the next five years. It's getting compressed into, you need to do it in the next 12 months. And so things that CISOs were, were really um, knowledgeable about how to control have rapidly gone away and they're gonna have to find new techniques in order to protect the data. And so if you think about things like packet capture or man in the middle for examining web gateways and stuff like that, like a lot of that is gonna go away if it hasn't already. You know, TLS 1.3, you'll never be able to see in the middle of a packet again. So how are you gonna protect that? You have to think of new ways and have to look at how the tools are evolving, right? And what I'm seeing is because so many security people rose up through the network and infrastructure ranks, there's really a shortage of cloud savvy or container savvy or whatever professionals that really understand where this is all going. And so I would also say that if you look at just technology in general, um, how it works within an organization, and then the expectations of a business are likely misaligned. And, and so number one, the enterprise where they used to feel like, hey, if I, oh, I, I want to automate a, a business function or I want to enhance something I'll do with technology, I got to go down the hall and, and get on the CIO's agenda and go get it changed. Well, now you can whip out a P card and you can enable a new cloud application, which is a very different situation, right? And then two, a lot of times what we as technologists think, oh yeah, I'm deploying super modern technology. You know, around 2008, when the iPhone came out, what used to be great about being a technologist is, you know, I always had the coolest, latest and greatest technology. I had laptops before everybody had them. You know, I had cell phones before everybody had them. You know, even before that, I had pagers with the only people that had pagers were doctors and IT professionals, right? And so around 2008, when the iPhone came out, suddenly consumer technology was affordable and better than enterprise technology. I don't have to wait for my good to you know, depreciate four years as a consumer. Hey, if a new iPhone comes out and I want the new and latest and greatest iPhone, I just go and get it. And so now consumer, you know, the people in the enterprise are going like, why is the technology in my house better than what I'm experiencing at work? That doesn't make sense, right? And so that's where IT is starting to get the, the perception in some organizations of like, well, are, are you an enabler for me? Or, you know, are you always going to lag in technology? And then from a security standpoint, you know, I, I think when we went to the cloud, where it's like, oh, well, you know, I'll get a, a CASB product or something like that. And, and that'll work for me, right? I'll see where all my shadow IT and that is going. And what we've discovered is like, wow, it, it can kind of show you what's going on, but it doesn't really necessarily control the sprawl in, 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 in handling that is difficult, right? And, and so how, how should we deal that with that? And so 
what I would ask is, you know, are control models still effective? So, you know, we're Americans and we, we love intersections. And, and why do we love intersections, right? They, they, you know, traffic lights at intersections give us very set rules that we must follow. And, and they take a lot of the human element out of it. And, you know, we tell people what to do and how to do it and when to do it. If you look at a roundabout, what it's relying on is social norms in order for people to move through the intersection. And, and so the rules are easier to understand. And, 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 you know, and when there's a failure, when traffic lights go out, like super hard for people to figure out what to do. And, you know, roundabouts, they don't really need traffic lights. If, if, and if they are metered by a light, hey, you can kind of figure out what to do. And so, you know, if you look at this, there, there's only 16 points of conflict at a roundabout. And if you look at a traffic lighted intersection, there is actually, you know, 56 points of conflict, right? And, and so, but in our minds, we think, well, because I have these traffic lights, it's safer, right? And it's like, actually, no, traffic lights have 75%, you know, more injury collisions and 90% more fatalities, right? And you think, well, but the throughput's more efficient because the rules are there. And it's like, actually, you know, there's an 89% reduction in delays in a roundabout. Um, maintaining them is obviously less costly. And, and again, when there's a power, law, a power loss, it really doesn't affect one. So I, I would use this analogy to, you know, I hear people say it all the time with security controls. Well, we have the security control because PCI says I have to do this or HIPAA says I have to do this and all that. I think they're, they're really good guidelines, but if you have a business reason why things need to work differently and, and you can describe the risk, like you need some flexibility in those rules. And I think too often security people rely on that old security blanket of, well, that's what the, the, the compliance rules say, instead of really looking at the business risks that they're mitigating and say, is this a risk worth mitigating or not? And then on the cloud side, from the CIO perspective, I hear this all the time. Well, cloud's not really cheaper, right? It, it, it's like, actually it's, it's a lot cheaper, but you have to deploy it properly, right? And you have to look at it from end to end. So I, I, I like to use, since we're, you hear about Kubernetes and containers, I'd like to use a, a an old analogy of containerization, there was a guy by the name of Malcolm McLean. He was a Scottish immigrant. He came to the US and he, he bought a truck down in southeastern US and started a trucking company. And over the years, he grew it to be a pretty big trucking company. It was one of the largest companies in the South. And so one of the things that he got frustrated by is every time that he would show up at the dock, and he would want to drop off his payloads, what would happen is, you know, the stevedores would say, hey, get in line. Okay, yeah, well, unload your truck when we get to it. And, and sometimes it was a day, two, three days later. And when these trucks are sitting idle, they're not going anywhere. And then even when they're unloading the trucks, what they're doing is they're they're taking the cargo, they're putting it in boxes, and then they're lowering them onto ships and doing a Tetris game of how do I fit the most that I can into a ship. And so he got the bright idea of, hey, wait a second, why don't I just create a container where it's, it's already set and ready to go. When I get to the dock, I can just drop the container and the truck, and I can load up a new empty one and the truck can just go, right? And that container can go on a ship and it can go on a rail car, I'll create a standard size of it. And so he went and he took his idea to all the shipping companies in kind of the same thing. They looked at the paradigm and said, listen, hey, when I fill a ship, it doesn't matter if they're all perfectly aligned boxes or I play the Tetris game of getting them in. The fuel that I spend on taking a ship from Boston to London is gonna cost the same, whether it's perfectly packed or I did it Tetris style, right? And so he was like, you are not looking at the problem, right? He was looking at it 
from factory to consumer. And so he went and bought a few ships and he started using this method and shipping costs went from $8.56 to, uh, per ton down to 16 cents per ton. And that's because he looked at the problem from end to end. I would say this is the same thing with cloud. Yep, cloud right off the bat, if you take a lift and shift approach to moving your stuff out into cloud, of course it's gonna be more expensive, right? But if you actually modernize, and so for example, I'll just use a very simple example of vulnerability management. If you create something in the state of, hey, what I'm gonna do is a Windows servers that I run in the cloud, I'm gonna create a golden image. And then when patch Tuesday comes out, I'll create the new golden image and I'll start burning down the old servers and bringing up the new. Your vulnerability management team, like, you know, a lot of organizations have four or five people dedicated to doing vulnerability management. Like you could have a half a person, you just have to scan the new golden image and then you know it's good and ready to go. And, and so you, you've got to think about, you know, the new ways in, uh, of doing things and really leaning towards that. And that's where you get the value. And so we've really got to get better about thinking about, hey, how are we going to optimize when we do these things? And how am I going to take advantage of new technology to not only move faster, but to lower costs? And so... And I think why this is so hard for us is, is humans, you know, for, for those of you that are, you know, took any psychology classes in, in college, right? Um, we, we really have the issue of the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain, right? And, and our reptilian brain is what kept us ahead of, of lions and, and tigers chasing us down in the jungle. And, and so if you think about uh, those type of things are, you know, are, are predators in the wilderness coming after us. We only had to have linear thought. You know, the only math that my brain had to do at that point was what, what's the shortest path to outrun the predator, right? But now we're moving into a world that is highly exponential. And, and so, it, it, you know, and you can test this out. If you ask people, hey, I've got a pond and I want to cover it entirely in lily pads, right? In the site, you know, the, the amount of surface area covered by the lily pad every day will double in size, okay? And so I've got 30 days to cover it and I put the lily pad in. On what day will half of the pond be covered? And very rarely do people say on the 29th day, which is obviously the right answer because it doubles every day, right? They think, you know, 15th day or maybe the 20th day or they try to do complex math and it's like, well, it's actually intuitively obvious once you, once you see the answer, right? But a lot of people can't get their brain around it. And again, it's because we're, we're, we're thought to think linearly and not exponentially, but exponentially is how quickly things are evolving. And so, you know, I think a great example is you know, the IPv4 address space, you know, that's, that's, you know, about 4 trillion IP addresses, right? When we move to IPv6, what's going to happen is that's 340 trillion, 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 right? <laughs> which, which is a number that most people can't put their brains around. So to, to try to help people out with that, you know, there it's been estimated that there's 10 to the 19th power of grains of sand in the world. And each grain of sand on earth could have a trillion IP addresses. Or if we gave every atom on the face of the earth an IP address, we could build a hundred more earths and give them each a unique IP address as well. And, and so, you know, I, I think a lot of us laugh and scoff at things like, oh, yeah, when we harvest crops or whatever, you know, every head of lettuce will have an IP address. Maybe, right? Because the, we can start tagging things in a different manner and, and doing the analysis in, in the masses of data that we'll be able to consume will only grow, right? And, and so, and two, you need to think about Another example I would give is how people are using new ways to solve stuff 
is one of the challenges when delivering malaria medicine in Africa is I have to take people's blood, then I have to give it to a, a, a you know, phlombotus and they've got to look at it and say, okay, you know, yes, this person is infected with malaria. Okay, now go ahead and give them the shot, right? And so it was taking so long to diagnose that what was happening is if anybody examined any symptoms, they just gave them a the shot. They didn't do any sort of analysis on it or anything. They just couldn't keep up with it. And what happened is a lot of wasted, you know, a, a lot of malaria medicine went to people who didn't need it. And, and some people who probably needed it when they had shortages didn't get it. So scientists at UCLA created a game where it showed a bunch of blood samples on a screen and they train people of, oh, this is what malaria infected blood looks like. And this is what non-malaria infected blood like. And they turned it into a game and they would upload the samples to the game and, and people would pick, yeah, this looks like somebody has malaria or this doesn't, right? And they were as accurate as doctors within 1.5%. And so they use this crowdsource game is a way to help identify if people in Africa actually had malaria or not. And instead of it, you know, taking weeks to get the results back, they could have the results back within a day. And so it allowed them to actually treat people who had it and, and not give away malaria medicine to people who didn't. And so if you, if you think about it, you know, it's a very different way to look at the problem, but now we have opportunities of scale like we've never had before. And, and so how are we gonna take advantage of that? So I'd say if, you, if you're looking at the top technologies, <laughs> for 2020 and beyond, um, you know, in, in things you need to start thinking about, um, these would be, you know, my top six, right, is cloud-based AI, uh, you know, before why there wasn't a whole lot of people doing AI is you needed a massive amount of GPUs or some other highly uh, mass-centric processors, right? And a lot of people couldn't afford to put, you know, 600 GPUs to work, especially as startup work or exploratory work or one-time work. But now with all the, the cloud options that we have available to us, I can spin up, um, it actually costs me less to spin up, you know, 600 GPUs for an hour than it would cost me to buy one GPU and use it for six years, right? And so now I, I have massive amounts of compute available to me when I need it, and then I can turn it loose when I don't need it anymore. And, and so that's a massive opportunity and it really levels the playing field for a lot of people. Um, Sensor-based uh, in IoT technology, you know, I, I think a lot of people um, scoff at it a little bit you know, working in a big gaming organization, we were using it for a lot of things, you know, sustainability efforts, uh, food safety, where, you know, every, every refrigerator would have a sensor and tell you if the food inside of it was at proper temperature and staying safe, monitoring the saline temperatures of, tool, of uh, pools where we kept dolphins and things like that. So if you, if you think about where this is really going, and I just moved into a new house in July, um, I didn't install it. It was a nerd dream moving into it, but you know, my light switches, um, my oven, my dishwasher, my fridge, everything, it's all connected. And I all have it available to be able to control on my phone. Right. And so more and more of these technologies have come out and you're seeing it even in the insurance industry, in the health industry where they're saying, Hey, you know, if you, if you want a better, you know, premium rate, send me your Fitbit data and I'll tell you that you're exercising. Or if you want a lower car insurance rate, put the sensor inside your car and I'll tell you how well you're doing or how many miles you're driving or whatever. And so I think where before we're thinking, wow, this is really an invasion of my privacy and it's right on the edge. I think more and more we're going to accept this as a new norm because you're gonna want the discounts or you're gonna want those rates. And if you don't wanna give that data, that's fine. You'll pay a higher premium.
And, and so that's really changing things. I, I think UI overhauls, and what I mean by that is I think now when we think of UI, it's, it's hey, what's on my phone or what's on my computer or what's on my, you know, whatever. Well, UIs now are gonna be totally different. And, and you know, I, I use this analogy all the time too is, is, you know, when the internet first came out, well, we'll go before the internet. Um, you know, when I was a kid and I wanted to know what the weather was going to be like, I, I picked up the phone and, and dialed time and temperature and they gave me the time and they told me what they thought the temperature was going to be for the next day. And then when the internet came along, it was awesome because I could go to, you know, I could get up from the couch, I could walk over to my computer, I could go to weather.com and I could see what the weather is going to be like, right? Hey, 2008, now I've got a phone, a smartphone. I can just pick up my smartphone. I don't even have to walk to the computer and I can look and see what the weather is going to be. Oh, now I don't even pull the phone out of my pocket. I lean over and I say, hey, Alexa, what's the weather forecast for Coppell, Texas, right? And so it is rapidly changing in, in what your UI will be will will be more fluid and in, in demand a lot of different form factors and, and people will want lots of different ways to access the data. So we got to think about that. And, and on the scale of data, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people that are talking about data as a new oil. Um, data will far surpass any wealth that we've generated from oil. Um, just the ability to you know, crunch data, get user sentiment, all those things, um, you know, the math problems that we'll be able to solve that we couldn't solve before. Data is, is, is truly the new oil and it will help us solve problems that we've never been able to solve before just because we can now have so much of it available to us. Um, augmented reality, I think even more so than virtual reality, is, you know, imagine you're already seeing this in oil fields. Hey, if you're working in the oil field and you go out to a pump that's 20 miles from the station and it's broken and you don't know how to fix it, what you're seeing now is they have the ability to put on Google glasses and it'll step them, you know, you look at the QR code on the pump and it will pull up the instruction manual and tell them exactly how to fix it. In fact, while they're fixing it, it will record it and they'll have an audit that yes, this pump actually got serviced on this date and I can show you how it was serviced because I recorded the whole session. I think you'll see a lot more of this. And, and you know, one of the things that in the hotel industry you're even seeing is, hey, um, would you like to, instead of you having to fly out to my property and see the convention space, hey, we, we can just go ahead and, and put some glasses on you and we'll walk you through 10 of our different convention spaces in 10 different places and you can choose the one that you see is best for you. And even as ridiculous as it sounds, you're seeing this more and more as well is they're even talking about augmenting smell and things like that. So you could actually view a menu and smell the food before you order. And, and so seems on the edges of, of ridiculousness in some cases, but we're, we're seeing these things pop up and I would expect more of that. And, and the last one, and I think the most important one is SD-WAN and 5G penetration. Um, you know, the ability to deliver data at wire speed anywhere in the world is a total game changer. And so um, I was at the, the AT&T summit last year uh, before all, all COVID shut down in over a, a simple 5G uh, transmission spot, they were able to project a full holographic image on stage. And so the actual person, you know, it was a two person dialogue having a conversation. One was on stage in Dallas in the other, you know, in downtown Dallas and the other one was in Arlington at AT&T Stadium. And they were having a conversation with each other through augmented reality and, you know, to the casual observer watching it on stage, it just looked like two people on stage. And I, and I think the ability to deliver that much data in such a quick manner, again, with no wires and everything is just totally game changing.
right? And so we'll see more and more of this change the way that we do business. So back to our relationship with the, the CIO in, in the CISO, you know, what should they appreciate about each other? So, you know, let's, let's take the CIO first. You know, what, what should the CIO appreciate about the CISO? So cybersecurity is the number one board risk in the CISO in almost every organization I've been in has the ear of the board, right? Two, unlike the CIO, the CIO doesn't have to have a in-depth understanding of all technologies. Um, they can rely on multiple experts. The CISO typically does because they have to understand how to protect all those technologies as well. And in order to protect something, you really got to know how it works. So a lot of organizations that I've been in, I would say the CISO is as technical, if not more technical than even the CTO. And, and so how do you, you know, the this, this CIO can really take advantage of that when there's times that maybe they don't understand the technology or how it's being deployed, right? Um, I would also say the CISO typically has the most purview into the assets of the organization. So if the CIO is trying to get um, assets under control or understand where things are hidden in the organization or whatever, the CISO likely understands that, right? Um, and what should the, the CISO appreciate about the CIO, right? Well, for a lot of years, the CIO has had to work through budget and financial challenges in the organization. In a lot of cases, the, the only challenge that the, the CISO had to work through is the challenges of his own budget. And, and so the CIO likely understands how the budget interfaces work in, in where you can you know, spend more money if, if there's an opportunity and more revenue or whatever that the, the CISO typically just doesn't understand. So there's usually a better balance sheet understanding by the CIO. Um, CIO is likely to have a better understanding of the business priorities because he's in with the business almost every day. And, and so, and I would argue with most CISOs is if you don't have a deep understanding of the business priorities of your organization, how do you know you're protecting the right thing in the organization? And, and so, you know, I would tell you at my, my last organization, I had six competing lines of business. You know, we had hospitality, we had gaming, we had, you know, restaurants, we had retail, um, convention and entertainment, right? In all those lines of business, if you're ahead of a line of business, you're competing for those dollars, even though they're within your same organization. Well, you as a, as a CISO, I had to understand, okay, which of these six lines of business bring in the most, most revenue? Okay, how do I go and protect that, that revenue stream, right? And so hopefully the CIO can really help you understand those things and, and get you set on the right risks within your organization. Um, and, and two, a lot of cases, because the CISO for so long has been perceived as the compliance person, the CIO is usually perceived as the business partner. He's the guy who's gonna go arm in arm with a business person to the CFO or the CEO and say, hey, I think this is where we should spend the money, right? So think of them as a, a great way for, to introduce you into the different parts of the organization. And he or she can help you, you know, really get to know, um, you know, people in the organization that maybe it's hard for you to get exposure to, right? But the most important thing is I'd say is they both need to look each other in the eye and realize that, you know, um, there was a survey that just came out and said 80% of CIO CISO relationships are contentious. And, and they really got to look each other in the eye and say, hey, if, if we don't get in lockstep with each other, um, it will only hurt the organization. And, and we really both serve 
the same purpose within an organization. We just have different views of it. And again, it's back to maximizing shareholder value and maximizing the revenues of the business. And so if, if you're looking to, you know, be either a transformative CIO or a transformative CISO, you know, the key components of a transformation is number one is get your own internal house in order. And, and so, you know, I, I work in a product manufacturing environment, um, you know, where we manufacture software products. And, and so, you know, I tell the CIO this all the time, like, you know, is your finding security problems in the organization? Like if you find any in the CIO organization, like you need to pound me right away because we should set the example where I can go back to the product teams and say, you need to clean up all your issues because, oh, by the way, you should run it like me. So if, if you don't have your own internal house in order, it's very hard to get others on board and have them follow you, right? And then two, you should look to leverage new technology for innovation. So there, there's a Gartner model that describes um, you know, the, how you should view technology in your organization. There, there's the, the systems of, of commodity or record, which is like your HR systems and your financial systems or whatever. They don't really, you know, they're, they're necessary evils in your organization, but it's not how you make money. Right. And, and so those systems or commodities, you don't need to worry about them. I wouldn't apply a whole lot of new technology to that. I would do SaaS as quickly as possible and get that out the door. The next level that you've got is like your, your systems of competitive advantage, right? And those are kind of your secret sauce things. And those you do need to lean into to new technology a little bit more, take a few more chances. And, and rapidly innovate that. And then you do have your systems of innovation where you're looking for new revenue streams or way to greatly enhance your revenue streams. And those you got to move rapidly on and you really got to lean into the new technology, right? And, and so, you know, but what I see happen a lot is technologists focusing on technology strategy. And it's like, what's the business value of this? And I get it. Sometimes it's super fun to play with the technology just to put it together. But if, again, if that erector set comes together and it's not helping out the business, like, why did you do it? It doesn't make any sense, right? And so you can achieve this kind of innovation by, again, back to work like a venture capitalist. Like if you're, if you're making an investment in technology, you got to say, what am I going to get out of it? How high is that, that you know, revenue growth scale and, and how can I make it go faster, right? And you do have to show the balance sheet. So, you know, if, if you're going to go and do a big spend, you know, in some cases, yep, you got to do compliance work. I get it. But you also like there, there needs to be an ROI with your work. And two, you should be able to tie it back to a business priorities. Again, what's the strategy of your company? How do you tie it to the North star and how do you do all that? Right. And then again, in, in the new age, focus on ways that you can do speed and flexibility. When you've got a process really down and it's great, automate it, do it through RPA, do it through scripting, do whatever, but like focus on that speed in, in flexibility. Not everybody needs to be Netflix and do, you know, new releases every hour, but if you're doing new releases quarterly, maybe that's a problem too. And, and so you got to find the happy balance that satisfies your business. So in conclusion, I did want to leave some time for questions is, you know, one of my, my favorite guys, you know, that I've, I've uh, read a lot about was Gene Krantz. He was the guy who did all the odd numbered Apollo missions. And so, and he was uh, Ed Harris's character in Apollo 13. He ran ground control uh, during those missions. And in, in one of the things in often the most misquoted guy is he didn't say failure was not an option. He says, we have a lot of options and failure is not one of them. And so there's a subtle difference, but it makes it, and, and I like this quote is it's, you know, to recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but in trying, we did not give your best effort. You're going to have failures, right? CIO and CISO should work together with what's an acceptable amount of risk to take. How should we go about and do it? 
let's figure out how to fail rapidly and learn and, and keep on enhancing until we get it right. And, and um, the other one I like is, is Albert Einstein's, right? We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking that we use when we created them. And I think that really goes to if, you know, hey, when we move from mainframe to distributed systems, I'm embarrassed that I can remember that move. It just worked very differently, right? And now the move from distributed systems to cloud is actually kind of funny because it looks a whole lot like mainframe, right? Where the compute doesn't have to be near the person in order for it to work. And, and so we got to rethink our thinking again, right? And then the last one is, you know, Alan Kay who ran Xerox Park said, hey, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So I, I really appreciate your time. If there's, you know, if there's anything that you want to um, ask me, you can DM me on Twitter at Scott Hout. And at that point, I'd like to open up for any questions anybody might have. Okay. You guys are super easy. <laughs> I... Okay, sorry, we got, I'm finally seeing a question come across. When you run into challengers where the CISO wants to head in one direction and the C, CIO and CTO in another, how do you go about reaching a resolution? Um, it's a great question. I think, you know, I, I have this with my team all the time. Uh, I, I made my entire executive team read uh, five dysfunctions of the team. I think you need to get everybody in a room and, and, you know, we call it conflict and consent, right? We get everybody in a room. <clears throat> we have a very open and frank discussion where everybody brings their points of view to the table. And then we decide on it, right? And, and, and sometimes, you know, you win and sometimes you lose the argument, right? But we bring it out in the open and we all agree whatever conclusion we come to in the room that's the conclusion we take out to the rest of the staff. Even if, you know, sometimes I win the argument, sometimes I don't, but you have to reach a reasonable resolution. And, and I would, all, I would, it's always about um, <clears throat> some amount of compromise. Like, in, and I do get it from a CISO point of view, I've certainly um, experienced it before where the, the CIO will try to kind of bully their way over the CISO because, you know, the CISO doesn't understand it. It's just a checkbox guy. But I, I think if you bring, you know, valid discussion, hey, here's what we're not going to do it. Let me explain it to you. And then say, okay, let's all agree that we're accepting this risk or we're not and, and document it out and put it in front of everybody. That's how you got to do it. But I, I do, one thing you can't do because it will ruin the relationship is, once you, once you leave those, that's why it's conflict and consent. Once you leave the room, you all need to appear to the rest of that organization that you're together. Because if not, it will just lead to people will play one against the middle for the rest of the time that you're, you're working there together.
Uh, the next question is, where do you see most CISOs sitting? I've been shifted into legal, which is great, but it can also strain the relationship with the CIO who has an IT delivery agenda. I like the ability to push security requirements into IT, but getting prioritization is still a challenge. So, um, you know, I, I, I will admit when I went to MGM Resorts, so when I was at JCPenney, I had, um, <laughs> I had four different CIOs in seven years. And so I was like, oh my God, it felt like I'd, I'd get a new CIO, I get them on the agenda of where I was going, we'd start moving and then the next CIO would come in and I'd have to get her on a different agenda. It, you know, and it was just, <clears throat> it was tough. So when I went to MGM Resorts, they said, I won't, you know, if, if you come over and you want me to report to CIO, mm -mm, ain't gonna happen. I need to have a separate relationship. And that just created a new set of problems, right? So the good news is I had a direct conversation with the CEO, but there were times when I probably should have had the first conversation with the CIO and I didn't, right? And so I had a good mentor tell me one time, it's like, dude, the way you need to review it is like, there is no smarter person about cybersecurity in the organization than the CISO. And so <clears throat> you could report to the CEO, you could report to CIO, you could report to the CFO. It really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, no matter who you're reporting to, are they going to give you a lot of advice on how to do the cybersecurity things that you need to do? Probably not, <clears throat> right? So at, at that level, yep, yeah, there's reporting structure for administrative purposes, purposes, but you're the person, right? And so you need to go and form whatever relationship you need to form to get the work done. And, <clears throat> and don't be intimidated by hey, I'm a VP and they're an SVP or an EVP or whatever, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're the guy responsible for cybersecurity at the organization. You need to go talk and form a relationship with whoever you want to. And as far as IT priorities and all that, get with the CIO and say, hey, how, how do you think we should prioritize these things? And I get that you've got your work to do and I get that there are certain things that I gotta do. It looks smarter if we went to the CAO or the CEO together and said, hey, together, we think these are some of the priorities that we need to get done. And again, it's all about compromise. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. There are times when I get it as a CISO, you have to say, I know you think this is an acceptable risk. I disagree. We need to bring this up and, and, and escalate it. But I'll tell you, in, in five years, you know, when I was at MGM, I think maybe once, you know, the, the CIO and, and I couldn't get together and get on the same page. So I think, you know, just really work that relationship and figure out how to do that. Um, what type of data analytics um, have supported cross team objectives for competing directions and in, in saying risk-based analytics for clarification? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I do go back to a lot of times, again, it, it's revenue stream. And, and so an example that I will give you is, um, you know, when, when I worked at a, a gaming organization, we sell a lot of tickets, right? And to a lot of different entertainment venues. And guess what? There's a lot of ticket fraud. And, and you know, that's true in any industry, right? And, and what we're figuring out is it seemed like a lot of money because we're losing about a million dollars a year in ticket fraud. But on a one billion dollar revenue stream, like that's actually pretty good experience, right? And so, you know, there was my boss was like rabid about it. like I can't believe we're losing a million dollars. We got to go after it. Da, da, da. And it's like we're going to spend more money to try to recover that one million dollars than you know then you're stopping the fraud like that's that's an acceptable amount of fraud it's just cost of business let it go because oh by the way if i have to go spend my money i'd rather go and spend it on locking down our point of sale devices better because our food and beverage in retail revenue stream is about three billion dollars so i think that's a better priority and so when you're when you're talking in dollars in cents and using those type of risk-based analytics, I think it really helps a lot 
um, to put it into the, hey, we're doing it for these reasons, right? Um, compliance doesn't equal security. And with new technology, sometimes good security doesn't equal compliance. What is your process for helping auditors understand why an operational uh, security control framework should, should deviate from the framework, right? Because it's more cost effective and the risk compared to the standard control framework. I, I do, I think it's, you, you do have to put it in risk terms and, and you're right. Like an example I give you is, is, you know, RDP. Oh, you can't use RDP because compliance says you can't. And it's like, well, actually the reason you didn't used to be able to use RDP is because the credentials weren't, you know, secured in the authentication. Now it's encrypted. So like, there's no risk there. Like you, you don't understand the control. And so I think that's the question that I always, uh, you know, ask, try to work through with the auditors of what do we think we're controlling here? Let's talk it through and then let's determine if we have an acceptable amount of risk, right? Because especially that's a great thing. That's why I love most about ISO is the risk conversations are a little bit, you know, they, you can define the risk conversations a little bit better. But I, I think that is what, you know, you really got to sit down and, and sometimes it's hard because the auditor is just rewarded for checking the box. But if you, if, if you really put them in the corner of, hey, let's really talk about the risk and what we think we're controlling here. A lot of times you can get the auditor to the right place or at least a little closer to the right place than you were before. Um, what metrics and KPIs do you use to explain how effective the, the CISO and team are at addressing cybersecurity risks? Um, you know, it's funny. I had a board member who once a year, he wanted to see the, what I call the G whiz statistics. Like I block a billion events at the firewall. I, you know, I, I throw out, you know, 89% of my email is spam or phishing, you know, and, and I call them the GWIS statistics. So what? Like, I get it. It's part of, it's part and parcel of doing business, but it, it, it's not effective, right? And so we talked a lot more about how many machines were actually getting built, how many investigations we were doing, what the, the mean time to detect and the mean time to recover was. We, we spent a lot more on that. How much, you know, I like the one that I love is how often does a cash register have to be built? Like, because again, when cash registers are down, it, it, you know, especially in a retail or hospitality in, industry, that means money isn't flowing. So we talked a lot about stuff like that. Um, boy, working in the gaming industry, like gaming floor outages, they certainly knew it. So, so we talked a lot about how we would protect the gaming floor, right? And, and so I think it's, you know, what, what's the key metrics to your business? Is it manufacturing? It's how, how much output you get in an hour and, and things like that is, you know, what's the key metric for your business? Yep, there's some security KPIs that, that maybe you should always show, but I would lean more on, you know, how is security being used to recover the organization? Um, how are you protecting revenue streams, all that? I think it's, it, it's a certainly, especially when you talk with board members, it's, a, it's a, a conversation that they certainly get. And I think, oh, by the way, they also appreciate, like they wanna hear more about it. I think that's all the time we have. So I really appreciate um, all the questions and, and I appreciate y'all's time. Thank you for your attention.